So this is our first assignment. I'm going to probably extend the date on this right now. It's we still are still got some discussions to do on hedging and things of that nature. So you're not quite there. And that's okay. I told you I'm not a slave to the calendar. I'm I'm allowing for things to be due when it's appropriate for them to be due and not just jam things through just because of the way I had previously thought our conversations would go. I like the fact that we're having some interesting conversations in class and if it takes a little longer to get through some material then I think we all benefit from that. So this is our assignment specification sheet. And you'll generally see this as a starting point, kind of basically giving you a little bit of a background. What are some of the things you should probably read with respect to the agreements, the contracts, and then what is the deliverable? In this particular case, what's the writing? And then there's going to be some discussion about the issues to address with the CEO. So we're writing this for the CEO. In this particular case, the CEO is not a finance or accounting person, and you know these are going to be individuals that, you know, if you were ever in a classroom with somebody who doesn't like math, doesn't, you know, is kind of a salesperson, this is probably the type of person you're dealing with. So these are the issues to address. What's the accounting for the loan? What's the accounting for the forward interest rate swap? And then what's the impact of establishing a hedging relationship between the loan and the forward interest rate swap agreement with and without hedge accounting? So those are the big issues to, to address. So we want to look at the forward interest rate swap alone, and these are some of the things to look at. Is it qualify as a derivative? So what are those three items that we've got to evaluate to see whether or not this is indeed a derivative? Just because a lot of other swaps are always derivatives, we've always got to evaluate and make sure that it still qualifies as a derivative. Then the next thing we want to do is, what's the initial measurement of the agreement? So when we think about the accounting standards codification here, you're going into that paragraph or grouping 30 or block 30, or however you want to call it, in the accounting standards codification under ASC 815-10. We want to then look at the subsequent measure, so that's going to be section 35 looking at subsequent measurement. Then we want to look at derecognition or termination accounting, if you will. And that's going to be section 40. And then disclosure, the forward interest rate swap, you probably are going to look at, 40, uh, look at 45 and 50. And so we're not looking for you to regurgitate the, the literature because the CEO won't get it. So you've got to take this very complex language and communicate it very clearly. With all of this stuff, we're trying to aim for instant understanding. Aim for instant understanding so that anybody can understand it. And then we want you to go into hedge accounting. And this is for the combined loan and the forward interest rate agreement. So what are the details? How do we qualify for hedge accounting? What's the initial measurement? What's the subsequent measurement? What's the derecognition? And what's the disclosure? There's a pattern shaping up here. And you'll see this pattern in the financial reporting area where we tend to repeat this. So we've got initial measurement, subsequent measurement, derecognition, and disclosure. Same thing here for hedge accounting. So it just kind of gives you an overview of the assignment. So there's two contracts. I didn't give you the full contract of the loan. I just gave you the spec sheet or the term sheet for the loan. So let's just take a look at the Bank of America term sheet. Very short. So they're planning on taking a loan out and it looks like they're gonna take this out, a 10 year loan, it's due December 31st, 2030. So it looks like they'll take this loan out January 1st. So that would be the start date given 10 years. January 1st, 2021. And we start looking at the term. So we've got a 10 year loan. We got quarterly repricing. We pay interest 
and pay. It looks like we pay interest only, because the payment of the principal only happens at maturity. And then there's also the sinking fund requirement, which is a million dollars a year deposit with the Bank of America. So we're basically putting in half of the. It's still our money. But just from a security standpoint, Bank of America wants to create a sinking fund requirement. Some interesting things to talk about with that, if you want to. It's kind of extramural types of thinking and extramural types of discussion with the sinking fund. But you can imagine we don't want to wait until 10 years from now to come up with $20 million in cash. So we'd like, they're trying to reduce their overall credit risk by requiring the sinking fund and have the money to deposit. It's still our money. We don't have that. We don't, we, we really can't have access to it because it's part of a sinking fund. So the variable rate interest is the one year treasury rate. Now companies would much rather have fixed rate loans. Because that way it's predictable. We know what our interest rate is going to be. And we've got a one-year treasury on five, with plus 500 basis points. That's the spread. That's how we priced out. So if we just did this loan and that was it, I mean, we'd just be talking about debt, you know, debt accounting, long-term debt, blah, blah, blah. Not that interesting. But there's, there's a reason. Obviously, there's something going on that they wanted to go and get a swap. So let's just take a look at, and this is, you know, let's let's take a look. You know, so this is just the the loan agreement. Let's take a look at the swap. And we throw a little bit of of a curveball in here. This is a forward starting interest rate swap. So it's an interest rate swap and a forward combined. Again, it's interesting. Now, I'm not here to trick you. As you get questions on these kinds of things, talk to me. We'll share it, but this is how you're going to learn. You know, thinking about how, how would you approach this? And if we go back to, the first thing we got to go back to is thinking about all the different variables that are in an interest rate swap. And this is the the notes from one of my pre-recorded videos. So you have to understand who the counterparties are. And so as we're, as we're thinking about reading the swap agreement, I'm going to keep this handy because basically this is my little checklist to figure out, you know, what's going on, you know, who are the counterparties? What's the notional amount? What's the start date? What's the maturity date? What are the payment dates? And the start date's interesting because the start date happens three months from now. But we're entering into the interest rate swap agreement, the forward agreement right now. It's interesting, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not, we're doing this because it's interesting. It's how do you how do you approach this? I'm not here to trick you. I'm here to throw something at you and we'll talk you through it. So I'm gonna go through this and I'm gonna try and fill in all the blanks. Understand who's paying the fix, who's paying the floating, what's the basis of the calculation? Is there netting? And what's the basis of the floating rate? Is it LIBOR? Is it US trade? What is it? So they get my underlying, I got my notional, and then this is going to help me figure out whether or not, after I look at all of this, do I have a derivative? Should I be in ASC 815? Or should I be somewhere else? That's how, that, that's how I'd approach it. I'd start trying to figure out when I read this contract. Who are the parties? And make sure you pay attention to definitional definitions here. So here's a party now referred to as the issuer. 
We're not ever going to talk about Goldsmith Locks again. We're just going to be talking about issuer. We're going to be talking about purchaser. So I want you to be, you know, again, we're going to start some of the discussion tomorrow if we, if we get to it. If not, we'll get to it on Monday as far as breakout rooms and have you guys think about it. And maybe over the weekend, you'll have a chance to read it, think about it, contemplate it. And then start kind of crafting what the argument is. What's happening here? What do you want to communicate to the CEO in simple, easy to understand language? So that, would, that might be a starting strategy. And then as we have conversations, whether it's through office hours or in the classroom, we'll have those things recorded so that we can make sure that we're sharing all of my discussions with you on how to approach these kinds of questions, these kinds of transactional issues. 